Welcome to Glue. My guest tonight is Charlie McMullen. How are you doing tonight, Charlie? What's up, Marty? I've wanted to have you on the show because what you do is is not an easy thing. The comedian is a job that a lot of people see people doing and uh, imagine they can do. But then as soon as they try an open mic, there's a lot more that, that goes into it. Uh, no one is really good at comedy before they've been doing it for at least, like, I would say five years at best. Ten years is probably closer. Uh, comedy is just an ongoing process. Uh, it's just it's something I do because it's, like, immediately rewarding. Uh, because everybody wants to get out there and contribute in some way that will help someone else. And if you're a comedian and you make someone laugh, that's just instant happiness that you just gave a person. I love that. Absolutely. Cannot but, get enough of that, man. But, you know, it's not easy to make people laugh, especially if you're the opener. Because if you're the <laughs> opener, you're basically cannon fodder. Yeah. You're you're the fluffer. You're, you're, the, you're just the... <laughs> The fluffer who doesn't even get her name in the credits, you know what I mean? Oh, so true. So true. And having been a part of the comedy scene for as long as I had been over at Peppers and the comedy show that we had, one thing I definitely know is that, like you said, it seems like a really easy thing to do until you step up there, the lights hit you, and you tell a joke, and then nobody laughs. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it's in like a social situation, like if you're at a party and you tell a joke that's not that funny, it doesn't take much for a person to give you a courtesy laugh and then go talk to someone else. But if you're at an open mic, there are people just daring you to make them laugh, especially at an open mic. The audiences at an open mic, the ones that go on purpose are like very jaded when it comes to comedy. Like they, they're they sort of comedy hipsters, like they look for anything they haven't heard of yet and they're just ready to shit all over it. <laughs> And uh, most of the audience, though, at an open mic are people that were just there at the bar anyway, drinking on a weeknight for reasons of their own, and then comedy just just happened to start. Those ones especially are tough because, like, they were there first, so they have, like, a sense of domain, uh, so they're way more likely to heckle in the middle of a joke uh, or just shout random stuff out, even if it's not heckling. Yeah, so o- open mics... Uh, are, are like the first stage, I think, of a career in comedy. When you go to an open mic, you have to do it uh, in as many different towns, I recommend, because like when I started out in Pueblo, I would go to a couple of open mics in Pueblo. My friends would be there. Everybody would laugh. I would get like sort of a big ego and say, man, I'm really good at this. And then I'd go to one in Springs where nobody knows me. And uh, it just it wouldn't go well. Like You just keep doing it until it goes well everywhere uh, where you don't need friends in the audience. What's your ideology on hecklers? Because so many people have such a different take on on the actual heckler themselves. Some people, they, they choose to ignore it. Mm. Some people, they bring them into the act and they just nuke them right there and right. just destroy them. Uh, Sam Kinison was one of those guys. Oh, that Sam just, Kinison was a surgeon with hecklers, man. Oh, brutal. He was brutal with them. What's your take on it? More often than not, I take the coward's way out when it comes to hecklers. I just ignore it. If it's just one person who yelled something out, I just won't even acknowledge it. Uh, it's the safe way to go because you just continue, and hopefully you get to something interesting enough to make the audience forget that someone even said anything. Uh, ideally, you would want to go after them uh, like really quick, but not too mean. Because uh, if you're mean... Like, speak, like it's happened to Sam Kinison a couple of times. Uh, Bill Hicks, especially. There's a clip on YouTube of Bill Hicks completely losing his shit at a heckler. And if you if you go too far into that, then the audience just gets weirded out, and they're just not going to laugh at anything after that. Right, because you've done gone American Psycho. Exactly. On You're watching the chainsaw just fall down the spiral staircase. Yeah, it's like if you, oh. co- <laughs> if you cooked, like, a nice dinner for everyone... And uh, one person said, you know, this isn't very good. And then you punch them in the face. The audience are the other people at that table. Like, what in the hell just happened? Wow. Yeah. So it's it's like a very, very fun, like very thin middle path that you got to find when it comes to hecklers. Usually I'm not up to it because I've I've been doing comedy about four years now and I'm not that good at crowd work. And you see, that's that's just uh, another thing about you is that. You're such a cerebral comedian. <laughs> the things, the, the path that you take, it's, it's something that you've 
contemplated, that you've considered. Does that come from your film background? I think, yeah. I mean, part of... Uh because I I've done a I've directed a few movies and uh, written a few scripts and then uh, when you're writing stand up of course like the screenwriter's uh, twitch is going to happen in your brain and you you're thinking cuz a joke that you're saying to an audience is just dialogue more often than not I'll go back and just punch up dialogue that has nothing to do with like the premise or the punchline it's just something uh something to throw in there because it's it's witty or you hope it's witty but if you do too much of that then the joke gets really clunky I've had a few like that where I try to make just the elaboration and the detail part of the joke and sometimes it works and sometimes uh, you lose an audience really quick how do you gauge that I mean is it um, is it like kind of like a game of battleship and you kind of line up your jokes in a row and kind of go well let's try this one and see if it hits anything and if it does I'll go along that line and if not oh shit I better move move right along well, I mean, it, it depends. If you're if you're an opener, uh, like using uh, loonies in Colorado Springs, uh, just an example, because I've done that club more than any other. Uh, if you're an opener, you go up like completely cold. There's, uh, I mean, they have like YouTube videos that they show like with a projector before the show starts. But other than that, you're going up completely cold. Like you have to be able to um, make it make it apparent what kind of an audience it is because the feature and the headliner are both watching at least the first couple of minutes of your set just to see what people are laughing at so as an opener you have to have like th at least two or three different kinds of jokes ready to open with uh in case the first one doesn't fall uh or well in case the first one just uh gets the gets a reaction but not the one you were going for uh you can sort of tailor the second joke uh based on your impression of the audience. It's very, it's a lot of shit that you have to think about while you're on stage in front of a whole bunch of people, which is nerve-wracking enough as it is. Right. Because I still get nervous before every single show. A lot of people don't take into consideration how much time is involved, too, just in, in your show prep. I would imagine you have to be disciplined enough to come up with new jokes, to stay topical, to uh, write something different and new so that when you're going to different venues you're 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 keeping it as fresh as you possibly can right you got to be uh very prolific like uh maybe like of all the different kinds of writing jobs there are comedy writers one of the biggest volume ones uh because like i'll i'll see a comedian that i saw um at an open mic like two years before and he's now uh featuring and headlining at clubs and he's doing the same jokes that he was doing two years ago that's I don't know if tacky is the right word, but it's just not, you're, you're not trying if you're doing that. Exactly. I mean, there are some jokes that every comedian has that he'll do every time. Like he'll rewrite them as time goes on, but, uh, there, there are a couple of constants, but when you hear like stuff bomb in 2012 and then you see him again in 2015 and the same joke is still bombing, that's just lazy. Oh yeah. Well, you and I both know. I'm not going to say any names or anything. But right. You and I both know individuals that have been in the comedy scene for quite some time. In fact, they have been in the comedy scene when I was hosting the show and we would have them on our stage. Sure. And I went to go see them recently and they're still telling the same right. jokes. Oh my, I, I don't even know what to say. Jokes that, that weren't even topical at the time. Exactly. <laughs> it was horrible then, and now it's even more horrible. Yeah. How, how are they still doing it? I don't know. I mean, some people, I don't know. I, I can't speak for everybody, but I remember uh, I was doing comedy for about two years, and I was at the point, like, I was doing okay, but I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was making any progress. So I was getting to the point where, uh, I don't know if I should continue with this or focus energy on something else that I might do better at. And uh, there's a show that you have that is so good, it's uh, it either is enough to propel you forward or it's not. And uh, some comedians have gotten to a point where they're doing okay. They can stay along at the pace they're going. They just haven't had that show that makes them want to do better. Do you get any feedback from other comedians or is it pretty cutthroat amongst each other? Because it's direct competition. In my experience, it's been a case-by-case -case basis. Some comedians are extremely cutthroat with each other, uh, especially when it comes to, like, booking new shows at different venues. Uh, some people, like, once they start doing, like, an open mic at a, at a certain bar, they consider that their territory, and if you try to book a show at that bar, they will get 
like you'll wake up with like a not a horse head in your bed, but something. Uh, some comedians are very cutthroat. I I'm never shy about giving people feedback. I always uh, like ask them if well, like a good example would be last Thursday here in Pueblo, there was an open mic at the Rainbow Bar that John Bueno was hosting. Uh, he uh, he did one joke. Uh, like I'm not even gonna say what joke it is because he he does it in a way that that gets me every time. But it's about uh, the whole joke being an elaborate uh, pretext to say he wanted to fuck Dave Thomas from Wendy's. And uh, the way he did the joke was it ended with, uh, so if you're asking me how my ex-girlfriend is, uh, that was a lie. This was all a lie just to say I wanted to fuck Dave Thomas. Uh, I saw him do it a couple of days later at a different open mic, and I said, if uh, if you don't mind, I have one suggestion. And say the last line uh, should be if if you are wondering how my ex-girlfriend's doing, she's no Dave Thomas. <laughs> and uh, I guess you just got to gauge who you can approach with stuff like that and who you can't. It's just a matter of getting to know people. Because John, I know, is always open to suggestions. If uh, if he thinks something will work better, he'll he'll say, can I use that? And then say, and, you know, go ahead. A uh, few comedians are like that. Some comedians get really insulted if you have suggestions for them. I, oh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm never insulted. I'm always open to feedback. Sometimes I'll just, like, after a couple of days after a big show, I'll just Google myself, like, as a form of quality control to see if anybody has posted anything negative about it. Now, what are your thoughts of, of the greatest sin in comedy? Stealing other people's material. Hackery. I think uh, willful joke hacking is horrible. It's just, it's an insult to the person who wrote the joke. It's an insult to... The audience thinking they're not going to know. Uh, it's definitely just... It shows no integrity whatsoever. Uh, I think it's a sliding scale, though, because uh, if you're stealing someone's joke outright, it's obvious. If you're stealing, like, uh, a couple of lines, you shouldn't do that. But if there's enough of a difference between your joke and the person you're taking the line from... Uh, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. But I think willful joke thievery, uh, yeah, there's just nothing, there's no defense for that. So there's there's a huge difference between plagiarism and artistic license, right? Right. Uh, but even artistic license, I mean, in a field like <laughs> this where all you have is just saying what you wrote, you shouldn't even do that. You should just be 100% yourself because that's, comedy is... 100% a level playing field. Like, there's no equipment that'll make you better. There's no uh, supplements or computer programs that make you better. It's just one person saying what they thought was funny. And uh, to to steal from someone else, like, that's you're not telling the audience who you are. You're telling the audience who the person you stole from is, you know? Exactly. But you know what? It's even more than that because... Like Steve Martin said, it's timing, timing, time, timing. <laughs> so you can have I two mean? people, <laughs> two people tell the exact same joke. One of them will make it funny and the other one will fall just on their face. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. But if you, if all you have is better delivery of someone else's material, that's not good enough. Right. So what are your thoughts on people like Paul Mooney, who wrote for other comedians for a, a long time before he... Um, made made enough of an impact to where he could start doing his own stuff. I think uh, Paul Mooney should be able to use a joke that he wrote for someone else. Uh, it just depends on what kind of an agreement uh, he had with the person he wrote it for. Because uh, I've only sold one joke in my life. Uh, it was very. It's probably the lowest price that a joke has ever gone for. I sold a guy a joke for five dollars at a show in Colorado <laughs> Springs once because wow. I needed I needed money to get back to Pueblo. Uh, and uh, the comedian that bought it from me, I had seen him uh, in Denver a few weeks before, and he had a bunch of hitchhiking jokes, and that got me thinking about hitchhiking. Then I came up with one. So when I saw him in Springs. I said, you inspired this joke, and I told I told it to him, and he said, I will give you $5 for that joke, and he gave me 5 bucks and added that onto his hitchhiking bit that he already had. Sweet. It was pretty cool. So what did you spend the 5 bucks on, gas or booze? Cigarettes. <laughs> That's funny. I had a long drive ahead of me. I don't know. I think Paul Mooney is actually a, sort of a special example for that because Paul Mooney is someone who has delivery where he could take anyone's material and make it better just by saying it the way Paul Mooney does. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Um, like, it's surprising uh, to hear that he wrote for other comedians because I can't imagine anyone else doing Paul Mooney material. Like, in this day and age, it's just he had his own stamp. He was great. Yeah, the man's a beautiful mind, that's for sure. We've talked an awful lot about the the skills that it takes to make someone laugh, to to stay topical, to to be prolific. Let's talk about what do you do when it all goes wrong? How do you tr- how do you hold it all together to keep going? You know, uh, you can't say that every single time you go on stage you just knock it out of the park they they laugh every single time that I mean, definitely does not happen every time how do you keep it together how do you well that up inside of you to make it past the the really crappy the crappy days i uh, it's it's definitely difficult man it can be very depressing if you have uh, like two three bad shows back to back and it when you don't feel funny there's like no right way to feel funny again. You just, uh, I don't know. I, I try not to dwell on it. Like I try to welcome, like I try to start each show as like a fresh start if I'm in a slump, but, uh, sometimes it does get to me. Uh, the only thing that I can do is if, uh, if I'm not doing well on stage, I'll just, uh, come up with like Facebook jokes or Twitter jokes and just try to get some sort of positive feedback based on, you know, how many people liked it, uh, of those people, how many were other comedians, you know what I mean? You just got to set up situations for yourself where it can be a small victory just to get you through your slump, you know? Oh yeah. Cause I would imagine that it's an, it's an awful lot of, it's an awful lot of pressure, Yeah. especially cause let's face it, you're married. Yeah. There's a whole lot of pressure to say, you know what? You're spending your time doing something else what's in it for me are you are you bringing home bacon are you spending time with me are you telling me how you know how pretty i am you know there's i can't even imagine the amount of pressure especially yeah when when you're when you're hitting it so hard and you're trying so hard to do it and you show up the the pay isn't the greatest um, you might have a bad night and it's like, oh, I can't even imagine what that's like. You know, that trip home that, that we were talking about. Yeah. I, how do you get past that? Well, I mean, uh, there's a huge foundation of trust, uh, mutual trust required whenever, like regardless of what the situation is, if you and your spouse are spending a lot of time apart, there has to be trust. Otherwise, there's jealousy and suspicion and stuff. That will end a weak marriage, like, in the first couple of months. Um, like, I don't know. My wife and I just sort of came to an understanding because she has noticed how happier I am when I'm doing more comedy and how frustrated I get with, like, my day job and the day-to-day stuff when, I, uh, when I'm not doing as much comedy. I don't know. She just sort of sees that as a, as a victory. Other than that, I just, I tell her, like, I'm doing all this just like I'm paying my dues now so that maybe I can make a better living doing this down the road. So that way, like, we'll, you know, we'll have more money. I won't have a day job at all. You know, the open mics and the smaller showcases, that's all just a means to an end. Like, this is just the early stage of a bigger plan, you know? You know, that's funny that you mentioned that because that conversation that you just talked about was Mm -hmm. almost verbatim the same conversation that I had had with my first wife when I was... Operative word being first wife. Yeah. Okay, I see where you're going. (laughs) When uh, I'm going to school, I'm working at the nightclub. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm I'm working at the nightclub all the time. I'm going to school full time. And believe it or not, I've actually... I was maintaining a 4.0 GPA... And she was just so upset with me because I wasn't spending time with her yeah. and doing a lot of the things. That, uh, I mean, I sacrificed some of the attention for her so that I could go to school. And I, I told her, I said, you know what? This is for our future. Right. This is so that I don't have to do this yeah. for the rest of my life. And I told her, I said, you're high maintenance. But then maybe that's the reason why. Well, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you have to find uh, you have to find a, a woman who uh, who recognizes 
the future that you're describing. You know what I mean? Because uh, your first wife just probably like couldn't get past the possibility of you doing that for a living. Like she wanted, she was probably more of an instant gratification type personality, you know? And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you definitely have have to go through some people that are not as supportive as you need them to be. Because I uh, like I've I had never been married before, but I've broken up with uh, with a lot of girlfriends because they just they didn't see where they fit into all the other shit that I was doing, you know. Yeah, whatever path you choose, you definitely have to have the buy-in. Yeah, no matter what, because oh, yeah. you're you're all in it together, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like so far, I. Uh, my wife and I, uh, like, it's 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 not been an issue yet. I'm not going to say it's never going to be an issue because I'm, like, not even touring yet. Once I start touring, stuff might get more difficult. But uh, if you have a foundation of trust and faith, th- those are the two main things. And I think that and as long as you don't have an addictive personality. Right. Yeah. Well, I've recently quit drinking. I'm about five months without any alcohol now. Wow. Yeah. Because, it like, it got to that point, like, uh, John Brown and I have talked about this a lot. Like when you think about guys like Sam Kennison and uh, Richard Pryor and how success, like how people could jeopardize so much success on drugs and partying and stuff. It's because like nobody starts at that point. There, like there are years where you do a show at a club and, uh, you know, people are really happy. Like you made them laugh really hard. So they're buying you drinks and the club lets you drink for free. Because uh, the reason I quit drinking, because there was about a two-month stretch where about four nights a week I was either doing karaoke or comedy, uh, a situation where I could drink for free, and it got out of hand, <laughs> like really out of hand. Uh, so I understand how uh, how people can get to that point. Wow. that's, that's Without exactly. catching it early enough, I, I can see how that can happen. That's definitely a liberal uh, club that lets mm-hmm. you drink for free because I, I can't tell you how many comedians – uh, not only comedians, but bands as well that played at the nightclub that I was working at that mm-hmm. basically drank their entire check. Right. I well, have to show at the to venue. Do with a band because a band is like four or five dudes. A comedian is just one guy. Uh, it's I, I think from the perspective of the owner, it's uh, it's a better trade off. Like the if you let them drink for free, they'll be more likely to come back and make you more money. You know what I mean? Right. Because if you let a band drink for free, you're not making shit. No, no, not at all. (laughs) Not at all. I mean, even a Christian rock band will drink more money than you'll make from a show. Because that's that's actually one of my favorite uh, favorite jokes in the Blues Brothers. It really is because anybody that's worked in a in a nightclub kind of bar environment that's had bands go in there, that's that's real, man. Mm -hmm. That's real. It's like, no, you're not leaving until you pay. Right. Well, and I used to drink so much more after a good show because, like, when you have that feeling that you brought the entertainment and you gave everyone a good night, you want to celebrate. And if they're letting you drink for free, you celebrate your ass off. Right. There was a show I did at Looney's once just as an opener. Uh, I set a record for myself one night of the most free alcohol in exchange for comedy in one night. I had done uh, one show at Looney's. Uh, during which someone had bought me a shot during my set and they brought it to me on stage. So including that, I had uh, two shots of Jameson, one Jameson Rocks, and two Guinnesses. Then I went to an open mic in Manitou Springs at the Red Room where I had three Stella Artois uh, because they were given uh, drink tickets for to the comedians. And uh, by the time I had gotten there after the show at Looney's, the guy that was running the open mic was a little drunk himself. So he's like, just take some tickets. Here you go. Because he had, I got a whole roll of them. Just take these. And then I did a third open mic where uh, you get one one free drink for performing. And that set had gone really well, which I don't even remember. Uh, Apparently, I was okay, though, because like a bunch more people bought me drinks after that set. So I like it's a lot of a lot of alcohol in exchange for comedy. And if you can't control it, then you're better off not doing it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Especially karaoke on top of that. Like you've been to my karaoke shows a number of times. You know how like karaoke and competitive drinking just happen around each other. That's so true. Like you'll sing one song and then someone says, uh, I challenge you. And then they sing another song by the same artist and the winner gets a drink, uh, like from the bar and the loser just to be a good sport buys another drink. Like it's just insane. That is so true. So true. 
So where do you see yourself five years out from now? Five years from now, uh, at this rate, I probably won't yet be a headliner. Uh, but if I can tour the country as a feature at 300 bucks a shot, uh, if I do like enough of that a year, then I could make uh, you know, 50 grand a year. That's more money than I've ever made at a regular job. So I'd, I'd be happy with that. Like I don't want to be famous or even rich. I just want to do comedy as my only job. That's where I'd like to be in five years. That would be great. That's one cool thing about it is, as you said, it's instant gratification. It's it's instantly rewarding. Exactly. Like you you come up with a joke and you're like, people are gonna love this, and then you and the second you tell it, everybody laughs. It just it's a good feeling. For that to be my only job would be great. I don't need anything other than that. Have you ever noticed that comedy is almost as a DJ and as a, a KJ? Mm-hmm. Have you, have, and you know, now that I'm thinking about it, these are all probably very similar things Sure. that, um, all these things are kind of like nuclear reactions. You've got to put all this energy into it yeah. and you're pumping energy in, you're pumping energy out. Then all of a sudden you reach critical mass and pow. Yep. Uh, either they're, they're dancing or even either they're having fun and they're getting up there singing karaoke. Or if you're the comedian, they're out there just laughing their butts off at you and having a good time. Uh, the bar is happy because they're drinking. It's, it's just this, this, um, it's kind of powerful, isn't it? Oh yeah. It's great. I mean, you feel like you're just like in charge of everyone's destiny. Who's in the crowd. Like you're, they are all having a shitty night and you just made their night better. That's in some cases like four or 500 people that you can honestly say, I mean, you didn't, you didn't solve any of their problems, but you made them feel better about them for a while. That's uh, it, it's a very powerful thing to do. And like when you're DJing or if you're uh, choosing people's songs at a karaoke show, it's, I don't know. There's, it's like chemistry. You know what I mean? Like this is the attitude. Now, if I add this song, it'll take him to that level. If I uh, play this song, it'll move him up there. Then if I follow that up with this song, it'll move him down just a bit and then go even farther with the next one. It's great. It's like when you're making a mixtape for somebody, only you get to see them react to it in front of you. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So speaking of that, how long has it taken you to be comfortable enough to where you can give them the pause, you know, the, the little break, the time to breathe to where you're not going up on stage and expecting laugh after laugh after laugh mm-hmm. after laugh to where, you know, they, they need to be able to breathe and right. and chill out for a little bit. And then you, it, it's not so much, I don't know, cl- uh, to where it's a steady climax the entire time. Right. Uh, as as a nightclub, I've never been able to do that. <laughs> as a nightclub DJ, uh, I would have to you you give them a high and then you bring them down. You give them another high, then you bring them down. It's yep. this this constant up and down, up and down kind of thing. Uh, comedy is the exact same way. You just mm-hmm. can't you just can't hit them and then hit them and then hit them and then hit them. You have to give them a moment and. If you give them that moment, is is their experience richer for it? I would think so, yeah. I mean, with a comedian, though, sometimes uh, you, you only have like three or four minutes tops to, to do your thing, uh, like it at Comedy Works. Um, how you get in at Comedy Works is call the uh, new talent hotline uh, once a week, sometimes eight months. Uh, just call every week, give them your name, and uh, when they have you on, you only get two minutes. Uh, so you just have to decide what kind of experience you can give someone in two minutes. Like, you don't want to aim too high, otherwise, uh, you know, like like I, like I could never tell my best jokes during a two-minute set because all my best jokes are like five minutes or longer. Sometimes, like, it's sol- like I have a solid 20 on convenience stores. <laughs> like, I could never do that in a two-minute set. I, uh, so it's, it's weird. It's, that's more of an audition than anything else. That's like reading a monologue for a director. Uh, but if you have more, uh, if you have more time, like if, uh, the regular feature at most clubs, I think does a half hour set. If you have a half an hour, you can start off really strong, sort of take them, take them down in the middle and then finish stronger than when you started off. That would be the ideal way. And like doing pauses on stage, uh, when I started doing live theater, 
uh, that gives you a better sense of uh, of when to pause and how much silence is allowable. Uh, but then I started writing jokes that included pauses. So uh, you give them some breathing room, but it, if it's also like uh, helpful to the structure of the joke, then it's two birds with one stone, you know? Yeah. We're probably talking about stuff that people just never even considered when they sit there and listen to comedy. There, yeah. I mean, there's probably a few people in every show that are really paying attention to how it's done, and those those people usually go on to become comedians themselves. <laughs> because unless you're interested in doing that, there's no way you would want to look for all this. Because to the average audience member, they just they just go to hear things that make them laugh. Like, a lot of people don't even think about the jokes or remember them after the show at all. Like, I've talked to a lot of people who... Uh, like Def Jam laugh, like with their whole body during the show, and then when I'm talking to them at the bar after the show, they don't, they can't remember a single thing that I said, uh, because some people are in it just for the experience. Let's talk about Henny Youngman. Okay, take my wife, please. You know, I I look at some of the the stuff that he did and some of the stuff that he was just famous for, to where he's making the talk show circuit and everything else, and and they have him on, and he's doing these horrible oh yeah horrible jokes but yet there were some people that just thought he was the funniest darn thing on the planet oh yeah like my my grandmother loved henny youngman he's still her favorite comedian it's because when henny youngman was doing it uh the bar was very low not so much for comedy but just for the entertainment that people had available to him i uh, like you could never do henny youngman's act now because i uh, it's just people have have it, in 2015. There are so many entertainment options available. You have to give them something that they can't get anywhere else. And the more technology that comes along, and the more time that goes by, that's harder and harder to do. Because uh, Henny Youngman's material does not hold up at all no. today. Because uh, even a couple of Jack Benny's jokes would hold up today, but Henny Youngman, I don't know. I mean, that's why he had the violin. He's, it's just. It was more about entertainment than it was just about comedy. Is that considered shtick? Oh yeah, that's totally considered <laughs> shtick. I mean, shtick is such it's such a tricky word because some people that's what they're looking for. They want some kind of a hook, like they want to be the first comedian that plays the accordion on stage or they want to be the first beatboxing comedian, uh which by the way too late. I a lot of people do that now. I uh, I don't know. Some people are in it for that. Like, I think ventriloquism is just nothing but shtick. Because I can't... I don't consider a ventriloquist to be a comedian because that's just not what comedy is for me. Uh, some ventriloquists are very funny. Uh, Jeff Dunham not being one of them. <laughs> he used to... Uh, I, I introduced him at, at yeah. several shows. He was funny for a time, but he's just way too pandering and borderline racist now. Uh, like the dead terrorist puppet, Jesus Christ, that's, I don't know, it's a little too Toby Keith for my taste. Uh, but there was a ventriloquist back in the late 80s named Ron Lucas. You remember that guy? No, I don't. He, uh, he was very good. He just, the ventriloquism was incidental to him because he didn't have like a backstory or a clever name for like all the characters. Like he had this one dragon and, uh, it was just him and a dragon. It was more like vaudeville than it was ventriloquism, you know? Now that you mentioned Dragon, yes, I right? do know who he is. Yeah, that guy was really good. Um, but where is he now? Like, Jeff Dunham is, like, the most famous ventriloquist in the world, and what happens to guys like Ron Lucas? I think people do shtick because there are, there's a huge cross-section of the comedy audience that that's all they want. Like, they only want to see Gabriel Iglesias because they like the word fluffy and they identify it with him. Uh, they only want to see Larry the Cable Guy because they like repeating catchphrases, you know what I mean? Right. I don't know. Some people shtick is all they want, but you can only keep it up for so long. Like Gallagher's not doing it anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean uh, Gallagher even sold his act to his twin brother to get out of doing it, and nobody even knew I that know. there was a change. I always wondered if that was common knowledge or not, or if it's something that only <laughs> comedians knew about. But Gallagher too, I cannot believe they were able to pull that off for as long as they did. So let's talk about what you just kind of gleaned over. Let's talk about someone saying something, whether it's um, r racist, whether it's something negative, because there are definitely 
comedians that will take you to the negative. Sure. There are people that will try and keep their stuff as positive as possible. There are blue comics. There are the clean comics. And I'm sure you know that clean comedy is some of the hardest stuff to, oh, to absolutely. do, period. Uh, Garrett Waller and I just did a show at an international boarding school in Fountain. Uh, not only did we have to keep it clean, but there were kids from like China and Finland in the audience. Um, I had to ask the guy, I was like, do they even know what karaoke is in Finland? Like, is that joke going to make any sense at all? Uh, working clean is tough because like none of my material is is inherently dirty. Um, I just, I curse a lot on stage, but it's usually like his punctuation or just to emphasize one thing or another. Uh, so whenever I have to work clean, I do clean up versions of stuff that I would do anyway. Uh, I mean, there's some stuff that I can't clean up no matter how hard I try and some stuff that I would just never do at a bar show because, you know, like jokes about hide and seek that I'll, that I'll write about, uh, about stuff my daughter and I do like that's clean show stuff. Uh, like I would never do that in a bar show. I think jokes can only be as negative as, as people take them to be you know what I mean because I I will joke like there's nothing that I won't joke about I think that you can pretty much joke about anything as long as the joke is not coming from like a place of hate you know what I mean if if the joke is about you you have to be both the victim and the hero uh, if it's just a general joke it has to be I don't know it's difficult to say because I have like racial jokes that I'll do um, the test that I give myself before I'll do a race joke on stage is is it is it hateful or is it just ignorant? Ignorant is what I want because then you're inviting the audience to laugh at you. Uh, and I think as long as it's coming from a good place, you can joke about anything. You know, I, I forgot where I was going with that, <laughs> that original statement. I think it had some of the, um, something to do with something else, but you brought up a, a great point. And I can't even imagine doing clean jokes for a multicultural multinational yeah. group because how are you going to find these things that this entire group shares when it's an, an international crowd right i don't know you just try to um cuz i have a 16 year old daughter so in preparation for that for that show i just asked her like what are kids laughing at now and uh there, like what I learned from her is there's no there's no one thing you can do that'll make a teenage audience laugh. It's just it's just about relating your material to them, and uh, you depend heavily upon delivery in a situation like that. Like because a teenage audience, if they're not laughing at what you're saying, they'll still laugh at how you say it. Because like earlier when I mentioned uh, just the multitude of entertainment options now, teenagers especially, I've never seen like. Well, I won't say never. I would say after 2012, I have not seen a teenager without a smartphone. And, uh, like, they are constantly watching stuff on YouTube and Netflix and everything. The best way to entertain a teenage crowd would just be to um, just mention something that they from out of left field, something they've not heard about. Like, you want to catch their interest before making them laugh. Uh, that's the steep hill you're climbing with a younger crowd. And you add on top of that, like, there wasn't a language barrier. I think one kid at that show needed a translator, um, which nobody had told me about beforehand. I noticed that after every joke, one person sitting over there would whisper to the person they were sitting next to, and I didn't know what the hell that was. I'm like, what the fuck is going on there? And uh, like, they didn't. I didn't find out until later that it was an interpreter. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was the first international crowd I had. How does one interpret jokes you know into I don't a completely know. different language it's the same kind of suspicion i have if i'm watching like a foreign film i don't think those subtitles are conveying everything that you would get had you understood the performance uh there's got to be a lot lost that, in the that boggles my mind yeah. it really does i mean even just comparing curses between language yeah i i can't even imagine how you could really tie it all together uh, oh man well like plus in a situation like that, you're going through the interpreter because the the person who doesn't speak English is only getting what the interpreter chooses to give them. If you say something that the interpreter didn't think was funny, they might just skip that one. <laughs> uh, probably. Or, you know, uh, wow. Yeah, because at that point, it, it's 
really the interpreter that's the comedian because he's exactly. having to if the interpreter doesn't get the joke they won't know how to translate <laughs> it like both people don't get the joke he said something about his baloney having a first name yeah i don't know what that they means have no idea what that is <laughs> they don't know what oscar meyer is wow that's a hell of an experience yeah it was overall though it was a good show what uh what my daughter has told me before is like i i can relate to kids in a way that's non-threatening I think uh, would be the best way to put it. Just because I don't condescend to kids. I just, I invite them to talk about all this ridiculous grown up stuff and invite them to laugh at it. You know what I mean? So do you notice a huge change in what's funny when you were a kid versus what you see is funny today well, to I, kids? I don't think it was really a change in comedy. It was more of a change in how I would perceive it as I got older. Because I, when I was a kid, I liked uh, Robin Williams' Live at the Met. Did you ever see that show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my dad had, had taped that off of HBO. I would watch that once, twice a day when I was at his house for the summer. It was crazy. Uh, I really liked that because of the uh, energy that Robin Williams had in that show and the, the animation. And he got that Valkyrie helmet out of that chest and did oh, yeah. like five minutes with that helmet with the braids. Like, I loved that when I was a kid. And uh, I think as I get older, I get more into uh, like where George Carlin was coming from uh, with uh, language structure and the contradictions within the English language, stuff like that. When you're in high school and you're taking a bunch of English classes, you're naturally going to be more interested in that because you can relate to it. I think it's just a series of relating to different things as you as you get older. I see stuff on YouTube that people think is very, very funny. And as I get older... I don't think it's funny at all. Yeah, I've had a couple of experiences like that. Um, there's there's this guy, and he basically plays games. You're talking about that PewDiePie guy? <laughs> I wasn't going to mention his name. Oh, no, I'll mention his name. But I, I, <laughs> I, I, I watched it. A friend of mine introduced me to it because I'd never heard of the guy. Right. He introduced me to it, and he says, this man makes millions mm. doing this. And I watched it and I was dumbfounded because I was struggling to find anything even remotely funny about what he was doing. Right. It was just nonsensical. Yeah. I I don't know. I I think that might be a generational thing, uh, which is easy for me to say because I'm 35. Like, I don't I don't understand the appeal of that either. I just think I don't know the. There will always be people able to make their living just commentating on other things for as long as there's an audience that doesn't want to think about stuff for themselves, you know? I I think it's definitely part of a just a downward spiral of just the lack of pe- just the lack of analysis that people are willing to bring to their entertainment. Some people there's more and more people that just don't want to think and commentating on video games so other people don't have to play them. That's just an extension of people's laziness, you know. Is that the downfall of our society, really? Because it's definitely part of it, yeah. I mean, it honestly, I I don't want to go this direction, but uh, I'm just going to say it. Uh, as I watched the video, I was having a flashback of the movie Idiocracy. <laughs> and to me, it was like I was watching Owl My Ball. Right. That's that's what I was watching with uh, with his video. And I... I'm PewDiePie like, oh, is man. just is just real life Hormel Chavez. Uh, yeah, I definitely think that's where we're going. I see because working during the day in a convenience store, I see examples of that all the goddamn time, and uh, that's one of my biggest fears: is just that I'll still be alive the day our population reaches this point where there are more people that need to be taken care of than there are people able to take care of them. And uh, idiocracy is definitely where we're headed. I think, in retrospect, five hundred years was a generous estimate. Oh, on, yeah. on Mike Judge's part, I, I'd say 200 tops. I, I hate to say it, but I think you're right. Everybody just takes the talking head on television at face value. Mm-hmm. And as someone who's worked in in radio for as long as I, I had, that's one thing I just can't do anymore. If As soon as I see a talking head, I go, well... What's he trying to push? Yeah. Or what's what's the agenda? I mean, I'm just automatically skeptical. Right. And everybody's kind of upset over the whole, um, what's the NBC guy's name? Oh, Brian Williams. Yeah. And they're so surprised that, well, I'm, I just feel like I've been betrayed. And 
And I'm like, that's Monday. What's what's so different? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not a big shocker to hear that people are capable of lying about stuff. It happens all the time. Politicians do it. News anchors do it. I, I mean, Fox News is an entire channel that does it more often than not. Like, they've admitted as much. Well, all news media anymore, it's... Uh, we used to have the National Enquirer. And that used to be the joke. It, mm. well, oh, it's like the National Enquirer. And now the National Enquirer actually breaks more stories than other people. And they're well, they're using the National Enquirer model across the board. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some case, like in the case of major news outlets, maintaining credibility is harder than having it. Because Nash- the National Enquirer has no integrity to begin with. Like, they, they don't play by the same rules as MSNBC, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Because it seems like any time anytime there's a, a news outlet that tries to tries to get the upper hand and tries to go the the route of true journalism to where they're trying to stay away from opinion and they're trying to do the right thing, it doesn't last long. The, their ratings just kind of tank, and yeah. uh, all of a sudden it's yellow journalism and sensationalism, uh, jingoism, definitely. Oh yeah, I think. For as long as saying it first rather than saying it right will be the the norm, I don't think it's going to get better. I mean, it's more important to report the news accurately than it is to report it two minutes before the the other channel. I've I don't know. That's always kind of bugged me. That I think the priorities in journalism are all out of whack now. I think so too. Because how how are you really going to know what's going on around you and it's all gone downhill after Newsweek made O.J. blacker. <laughs> and as <laughs> and as a person in the society, how do you how do you find your compass, you know, and and find what's really important versus what the media wants you to feel is important because while well, they're selling you something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's it's difficult to say because I mean the motives of of a news anchor are different than the motives of advertisers that buy time during his broadcast. They just want people watching. They don't care why. And uh, if you add enough money, it's going to get to a point where the news anchor also does not care why. They're just going to enjoy the money. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, that's a very easy way to go. Uh, I think Fox News is just, is littered with the corpses of anchors that wanted integrity more. And that's just not not the way you do things anymore. I mean, especially with, with Rupert Murdoch, he'll say anything if advertisers are willing to buy time during it. Well, you know, it's, it's not even Rupert Murdoch alone anymore. I mean, cause yeah, no, it's definitely us, not just him. Rupert Murdoch is just the personification that's easiest for me to go. With. Right. I mean, it's not as if Ted Turner's like this right. lovable guy. Yeah, no, Ted Turner is just as bad. Uh, it's just easier for me to to picture like a like a Grinch like Australian man in a cavernous <laughs> office. <laughs> I mean, because Ted Turner was married to Jane Fonda, he can't be all bad. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I I don't know, but he's just he seems to me like uh, he's always frowning. Yeah, how can he doesn't seem like he enjoys his day? I I imagine that's true for a lot of like media magnates because at a certain point just money becomes the only driving force and you're just mad that you don't have more and then eventually you die there's just they don't allow themselves happiness because there's more money to be gotten you know right more power exactly more, more stuff that doesn't really do anything and speaking of money yeah wow uh there aren't that many comedians that just do so well financially is, yeah. Do you do you think that that's gonna take a a different turn, especially now that there are so many different ways to promote the individual? Because before you would have to pretty much go through certain venues. I mean, mm. um, unless you were getting time at like the comedy store, right? You know, pretty much nobody really even knew your name, and now that's kind of changed because you don't need the comedy stores and you don't need these other places to get your name out there Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that i mean are are you wanting to take the traditional route and and 
go face to face? Are are you working side by side using the new mediums to to get it out there? What are your thoughts? Well, I think just I think new the new media is just a, a new part of the process that's already been in place because there's really only one way to go. You ju- you have to be funnier than anyone else. That's uh, I mean because there are people that are not funny that are going to get uh, very successful. Uh, you know, Larry the Cable Guy comes to mind when I, I I read an article that said his net worth and I almost shit myself in horror. I mean, you can you can go that route. It's it's very easy, and if that's the way, if that's what you want to do, then that's fine. But I think there are a lot of comedians that we just never hear about. If you start with a comedian on YouTube and just follow the chain of recommended videos, you'll eventually get to someone who's like down closer to my level. Who uh, I mean, there's got to be a ton of uh, of comedians who like they've never had an HBO special, they've never been on Comedy Central, but they're making a living doing it. Right. And uh, like. Today is Monday. I'm sure there's a comedy club somewhere in Middle America where uh, there's a guy right now living out his dream, and uh, we just we just don't know about it because the pu- the general public is only familiar with like the top I would say ten percent of working comedians. Because uh, I I I may never get to the level of of Louis C.K., uh, but if I if I make a living doing it, that doesn't make me less of a comedian. You know what I mean? Right. And where does he find time? That's an excellent question. Louis C.K. especially. I don't know. Because he's had so many different shows over the years. I was thinking about this recently. He had the satirical sitcom on HBO. He had a regular sitcom on a different channel back in the mid-90s. He had uh, like a, a lot of pilots that didn't go anywhere. I don't know. when. I guess if you have that kind of drive, that's... Because we all have 24 hours a day that we can use however we want. And if that's your drive, then that's that's how you get to produce as much content as he has, you know? Talking about living it and breathing it, that's mm-hmm. that's almost to where you don't you don't have a life right. anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, to comedians that are in it for the right reasons, that is the life. That's, the, that's, that's your life, you know? It's definitely a dense... Uh, a dense pool of competition that comedians are are working for because we are all after the same thing. Because uh, all my friends at, the, at this point are other comedians, and when we go to shows together, we're all trying for the same job, a job that we don't, that may not even be available as far as we know. I don't know. I think every comedian throughout history has just used what's available to them to, uh, to make it your living. And... 2015 in Colorado is a very interesting time in history to be a comedian because uh, pot is legal. And uh, potheads love going to comedy shows and they love performing in comedy shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very interesting nexus Colorado uh, has become. Mm-hmm. There are so many things. Uh, I mean, we used to all talk about Amsterdam. Yeah. And wow, you it would be so awesome to be able to go to Amsterdam and do all these things and wow, you can do that in Colorado, but Colorado offers so much more. And right. plus it's it's a a larger opportunity for different experiences other than just that if that's what you're really going for. There are so many things that you can do here. Mm-hmm. It's it's amazing, really. Yeah, I mean, you take that and a social climate where uh comedy is looked on more as an art form than definitely than during the 80s and 90s it's it's a great time to be doing this well i really want to thank you for coming on the show this has been great man thank you for having me you're an incredible talent thank you 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 really are the the jokes that you you write they're they're amazing you're an inspiration because you know and i don't i don't use these words lightly and in all honesty if i didn't think that there was um that you're as incredible as you are. I, I wouldn't have you on the show. I Thank you, man. I don't um, hear those words lightly either. Because you don't give up. You don't quit. And I'm sure there have been many people that tell you, Charlie, what the hell are you doing, man? But you know what? You, you don't give up. And, and you are the epitome of glue. You hold it all together. You really, really do. You are a shining light and an example for others because you're proof positive that that hard work does pay off. People know who you are. 
Hard work always pays off. I mean, anything that you want to do, you owe it to yourself to, to do it as well as you can. Otherwise, then you're just going to be a substandard version of your dream. And why would you want that? Perfect ending. <laughs> Perfect ending. Thanks again. Thank you for having me on the show, man. I appreciate it. You've just listened to Glue. See you next time. Let's get sticky.